Hello, BookTube. I'm doing a little bit of BookTube catch-up this weekend. There's a bunch of events that I've been doing. I've been participating, but I haven't been talking about them. And I want to sort of correct that. A little, little poll in the water, let you know where I am, and also ask where you are. Another one of those events is, I've done a bunch so far, but another one of those events is reading through the Sackett novels of Louis L'Amour. Uh, Mark Richardson here is, is the, of course, the culprit involved because he loves Louis L'Amour, and actually so do I. It's uh, Whenever I'm I'm occasion to reread L'Amour, I always remember how much I enjoy this author. He might have weaknesses, and of course he has weak books since he's written lots of them. But uh, The Sackets, I think, was his most popular book, his most popular series. It follows a family that starts with one guy and then goes to the new world and branches off into a bunch of other, a bunch of branches of the family. And there's a kind of inbuilt interest in that. And for the Sackets, there's another event that I, that I talked about today, uh, Faith, Faith and Books and also Mark Richardson are doing a reread of the Hornbore novels of C.S. Forrester. And I talked about a phenomenon there with that series where Forrester wrote a book about Captain Horatio Hornblower and it took off. It was a huge hit. Fans loved it and they wanted more. And in addition to following Hornblower through his career, Forrester also thought, well, I could go back. I could tell all, all earlier stories from Hornblower's life. Very tricky for a number of reasons. Not only do you sap away a lot of the dramatic potential of the book because the reader suddenly knows the, the, the main character can't die or be disfigured or anything like that, but also uh, uh, because you are, as an author, you are running the risk of, of fouling up your own continuity. You'd think that authors have all this, uh, you know, in the book and volume of their brain, but they don't. They, an author can make their own problems that way. I don't think Lou the more cared about the second one, and I don't think he cared about the first one. I think he was pretty sure that he could get you in the palm of his hand for drama, when, no matter what. Uh, especially since, in, the, in this case, with the Sackets, the Sackets first appeared in uh, Daybreakers in 1960. That's the first time that, that we learn about a Sackett family. And it was only later, it was like a decade later, it was like the early 1970s when Louis Moore decided that, you know, I could tell earlier stories about the Sackett family, in including the earliest story. I, so he wrote this novel. He wrote Sackett's Land, uh, which is about Barnabas Sackett in England. He's, he's fishing lampreys out of the fence. <laughs> he's, he's nobody. He's a nobody. But he has the, that fiery... Uh, spirit of the Sackett family and uh he has that spirit and then that spirit gets a goose it gets a little help from fate he's scrabbling around in the mud one day totally by accident ha his hand falls on a, a, a group of roman coins of uh, ancient roman coins they're worth a small fortune they're worth more than any Sackett has ever made than all of them have made put together and they allow him they give him a kind of a stake in life and allow him to become a kind of businessman where he would never have been before. And eventually, uh, through a whole... He has, a, he has an arch enemy. Louis L'Amour is very good about arch enemies. He's also very good about humanizing his arch enemies, and that happens in this series as well, over and over again. But it, it happens definitely in this early one. This early story takes place in Elizabethan England. So a long time before the time period we associate with the Sackets. There is an arch enemy, and as usual, Louis L'Amour likes to have the arch enemy win a few rounds, legitimately win a few rounds. He likes to make you wonder whether or not the bad guy is going to win just in general. And through a whole bunch of plot skullduggery that I don't really, I don't really want to spoil it because you really should read this book. It'll take you an hour. It'll take you an afternoon. And it is so much fun. Barnabas Sackett ends up in the New World. That wasn't, I don't think, completely part of his plan. But he ends up in the New World, which is virginal, right? We're talking about the 16 the late 1600s, early 1700s, it's a virginal land. And he meets a whole bunch of other people who've washed up there. He ends up, I think in, in the beginning of the book, he ends up around the Cape Hatteras area. But he sees a lot of interior waterways. He meets American Indians. He meets a whole bunch of other newcomers to the land, including an, an Italian immigrant, who's his companion for a great deal of this book. And there's a wonderful moment Later on in the book, the, the two of them are talking. They become known. They've actually faced hardship together, along with a couple of Indians. Uh, they got to know each other. They give their thoughts to each other. And at one point later on in the book, right around the time that we are starting to really like Barnabas Sackett, that Italian says, 
well, you know, the, the vast interior of this country, the, these, these woods that have never been seen by a white man, ever, that might appeal to you, but it doesn't appeal to me. He famously, he wonderfully says in that moment that he is a creature of cities, of paved streets. And that he's, this new world, he's tried it, but it's really not for him. And in that moment, you are really supposed to see that it is for the Sackets. That regardless of circumstance, regardless of the of the villainy of the of the you know the, the nemesis in the book, this new world with its boundless possibilities very much is for the second. That's the moment when you're supposed to see it. Does it doesn't happen right away? It ha you have to read a bit a bit of the book to get to it. But the one thing that struck me reading this again, I don't remember the last time I read Sackett's Land. Uh, I myself, I have the, the maybe the unpopular opinion, especially the Sackett's read along. I have the unpopular opinion that the Sackett book, the Sackett's books, I think outstayed their welcome. A lot of them are pretty thin. This one is not. This one's not at all. Uh, one of the, the things that struck me about this when I was reading it this time was the absolutely beautiful evocations of that enormous, unspoiled wilderness. You don't expect that with Louis the Moore. You don't think. I don't think about that with him. I think about his cheesy dialogue and the fact that he never met a plot twist he didn't like. Never, ever met a plot twist that he didn't like. Uh, I think about those things. I think about the things that endeared me to him as a writer originally. Actually, the exact same way that I think of James Fenimore Cooper, I think of him for his cheesy dialogue and the fact that he never met a plot twist he didn't like. And just like with Fenimore Cooper, when I sit down and reread a book, I'm suddenly brought face to face with the fact that this person was a really good pro stylist he might not be considered that no one thinks that about cooper no one thinks that about Louis Lamore. but there are passages in here that are astonishingly wonderful explore just describing the natural world without before the shot rings out of nowhere or something was some, some, some louis Lamore thing like that apart from that uh i don't think that by the time Louis Lamour wrote this, he knew that a lot of Sackett fans wanted to read this. They wanted every single moment documented in the Sackett family history. And he went a long way towards fulfilling that, a long way. But I didn't get the impression in this book at all. I, another thing that I was worried about, the thing that I mentioned, is that in basically you would call this a prequel. I think you'd be... That word really doesn't do the book justice. But in prequels, often you get the feeling that you are just having boxes ticked and that the whole point of the book is to gear you up at the end to go on to the next one. This felt finished to me is what I'm trying to say. This felt finished in a way that I wasn't expecting. I did not appreciate a, a, a full, it's horrifying to think of, but a, a very wide ranging reread of Louis L'Amour might be in order because I loved this. Absolutely loved it. <laughs> this was just fantastic. And, and it had lots of really good callbacks to the Roman coins, to the arch nemesis, to the old world, even to lampreys. <laughs> it has lots and lots of... We think of Louis L'Amour as, you know, this guy in a cowboy hat that got an award from President Reagan. We think of him as your grandfather's favorite novelist, the only novelist that your grandfather read. That That's endearing in a way. Certainly his fame was built on that. A large amount of income was built on that. But we don't think of Louis L'Amour as someone who was sitting at a desk, granted, probably in a naked log walled, you know, room with with mounted antlers on <laughs> them. Probably that part is true. But we don't think of it as someone sitting at a writing desk poring over the details of plots and previous chapters and manuscript pages. But this book, I think, demonstrates I don't know that I've never read a Louis the Moore biography, but I, I think this book demonstrates beyond a shadow of a doubt that he did that and that he was pretty meticulous about it. So I, I wanted to jump in here and say that I have not mentioned the Sackett's read-along, but I am definitely doing it. And oh my God, what a start. What an absolute start. Now, I don't know what I'll do here next. I don't know if I'll go on to technically the next chronological book or if I'll just pick another Sackett novel at random. I'm only going to do one of these a month. I don't want to fall into the, the gravitational well of just reading lots and lots of Louis L'Amour because there's lots of it out there. I've got lots of other reading to do. But I wanted to chime in. I'll leave links to uh, the appropriate videos, anybody that I can find that's done a video on the Sackets. Uh, and, of course, to Mark's channel. You all know Mark's channel. And uh, I don't know what to say here. I, I, I mean, Mark is also involved in, in a Horatio Hornblower read-along. And Hornblower, 
there's a strong case. You can you can go up to somebody who's never read a Hornblower novel and say, well, there's a lot of working parts here, right? There's history. It's historical fiction. It's nautical fiction. It, you've probably seen the movie Master and Commander. There are a whole bunch of different avenues to talk to someone who's never read any Hornblower to get them to maybe consider it. Louis L'Amour, much harder case. Most of the time when you meet a reader, their idea of Louis L'Amour has already been cemented. They remember their grandfather's study where they weren't allowed to go, and all these books were there in leather-bound collector editions. And as they've grown older and told themselves that they've grown more sophisticated as a reader, they have come to look down on that. They've come to think, oh, so that's what he degenerated to by the time he was as old as when I knew him. So he was only reading this guy. So it's harder to recommend Louis L'Amour, but boy, oh boy, you don't want to... I very much can recommend the reading experience that I had rereading Sackett's Land. Very much so. <laughs> so. Let's just put it that way. So that's another YouTube event that's ongoing. Wanted to make sure you knew about it. <laughs> I will. I will wrap this up. I will try to 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 weigh in next month with another Sackett book. If I last that long, I may weigh in with another Sackett book earlier than that. But anyway, I'll leave links and I will wrap this up for now. And I will see you soon. Thank you.